It's good to be with you again. Week five, uh, we're going to wrap things up this week, but I'm so glad that you've been joining us. And just want to give a quick shout out to my friends in uh, Vietnam and Indonesia. I found out uh, last week that they have been tuning in and watching as well. So uh, it's very kind of uh, early in the morning for them. Uh, but they've been watching and following the lessons and enjoying them as well. And I want to thank you for being here all of these five weeks. Uh, those of you that have reached out to me on um, uh, Instant Messenger uh, through Facebook, some of you that have uh, texted me, uh, thank you for your text. Thank you for being a part of what we're uh, teaching and, and, and interested and desiring to, uh, to actually do what we're teaching you to do. Now remember, we are teaching you not only how to disciple a new believer, but new believers how to affirm your faith in Jesus Christ. And so for the first week that we were together, we talked about how that we have a surrendered heart. There are five characteristics of a disciple of Jesus Christ, and they are all characteristics of the heart. The first characteristic is I have a surrendered heart. And in the first week we talked about how that with a surrendered heart, God told us to stop doing something and start doing something. We surrendered our life to Him. We recognize that everything that we have, everything that we are, it now belongs to Jesus Christ. He gave all for us. And so we affirm that salvation. We know that salvation. As I know that I have a surrendered heart, well the next thing is I have a growing heart. I have a growing heart. Uh, a growing heart simply means that I'm growing in my relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm growing in the Word. I am growing in relationship with other people. And, and that growth begins with being baptized. I am now making a public statement. I'm going to make a public witness. I'm going to share my testimony with other people in my time of being baptized. Baptism is the evidence that I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I give Him my heart. I give Him my life. I baptize my body as an outward expression of what he's done on the inside of me. During my baptism, I want to tell people my story. I want people to know my story. So week number three, we talked about how that I have a servant's heart. I have a servant's heart. And in that servant's heart, I serve God by serving others. And how do I serve others? Well, I have to forgive my brothers and my sisters. I have to be willing to forgive others and how do I do that? Well, the, the way that I forgive others and I ask to be forgiven by others is I go and I share with them my story and I tell them what Jesus Christ has done for me. I share with them my life before Jesus Christ, how I came to know Jesus Christ and my life with Jesus Christ. And now that I'm walking in this relationship with Jesus Christ, I want them to know that he loves them. He cares about them. And as he cares about them, I want to share Jesus Christ with them, asking them to forgive me as I'm forgiving them, sharing my story, because I have a servant's heart. Last week, lesson number four. Lesson number four, we talked about how that I have a giving heart. We take money, a giving heart. But last week, we also talked about that giving is not just about money. There are five things that God gives to each one of us. Time, talents, treasures, togetherness, testimony. What is our testimony? Our testimony is God's story. So we are a witness of our story and God's story. And I taught you how to do that in the three circles. The first circle being my broken world. The second being God's perfect plan. The third being how that God sent his son to look for me, to find me. The world crucified him, but God raised him from the dead so that he could return to heaven and I could follow him in God's perfect plan. So we learned that in the last four weeks. This week, we're going to learn that I have an evangelistic heart. So an evangelistic heart, put your hands over your heart, then putting one hand out, you're just going to say, as you're pointing to other people, because you want to point them to Jesus, you're saying, I have an evangelistic heart. I'm going out and I'm sharing my story with the world. I have an evangelistic heart. So when we put them all together, this is really what it kind of looks like. And this is just so that you can have a little bit of exercise and remember how this works. First thing with your hands over your heart, I have a surrendered heart. I have a growing heart. I have a servant's heart. I have a generous heart or a giving heart. 
And then today, I have an evangelistic heart. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. What Jesus said to us, what Jesus was talking to his disciples, and what he expects us to do now that we are followers of Jesus Christ. And Jesus gives us a wonderful example of what an evangelistic heart, an evangelistic life looks like. We're going to read several scriptures today, and if you have your Bibles, again, we've taught you to have a Bible, either on your, on your phone or a physical Bible. If you don't have a Bible, let us know. We will get you one. And we're going to read some scripture today. Now, I'm going to tell you, we're going to be maturing in our relationship today. We're not going to read just two or three verses. We're actually going to read quite a bit today. And then we're going to draw from that what Jesus did to set an example for us of how to share... Jesus Christ, salvation, love with other people, and what happens when we do that. Now, a lot of us would not think that Jesus was an evangelist, but he was. Jesus was. He went from place to place. He preached the message. He gave life, and that's what he came to do. And so tonight, we're going to learn about that and see the example that he gives to his disciples so that we have an example to know how he wants us to do this. So, if you have your Bibles, the first thing that I want us to begin with is Jesus gives to us a command. Jesus gives to us a command talking to his disciples. Now, every one of you are a disciple of Jesus Christ now. You're going to follow and obey him. You've already repented of your sins. You've confessed that he is Lord. You've now decided that you're going to follow him in the perfect plan that he has for you. What are you going to do? You're going to obey his words and follow him. Matthew chapter 28 Verses 18 through 20, Jesus is talking with his disciples. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Read along with me. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, there's a second part to this. So he's talking with his disciples after his resurrection, and he's giving them this command. Now, please understand, this was not a suggestion. This was not an option. He was telling his disciples, this is what you are supposed to go and do. He wasn't saying, man, it'd be great, guys, if you would do this. No, he's saying, I have authority, I'm giving you authority, but there was something more that they needed. Go along in your Bibles, turn over to Acts chapter 1. Keep going from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of Acts. When you get over to the book of Acts, you're going to be in the very first chapter there. Very first chapter there, and we're going to read just verse number 8. We're just going to read verse number 8. Now, now let me set the example. So, so Jesus is talking with his disciples again. He is meeting with them. He is talking with them. And he gives them this additional instruction. He says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, follow along with me. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now we're going to come back and we're going to talk about that verse in just a few minutes. But we, we, I want to look, notice that he says Samaria. Why would he say Samaria specifically? Well, because there was something very specific that happened in Samaria. There was something that Jesus did that set an example for his disciples to know what evangelism, and when I talk about evangelism, I'm talking about you having a passion for your lost friends and family. I'm not talking about a call to preach. I'm not talking about a call to be a missionary. I'm not talking about going to foreign places. I'm talking about you having a burden. You know what a wonderful, radical transformation Jesus Christ made in pulling you out of your past, saving your soul, and giving you a hope to a future. And now you're walking in that. Don't you think others should? And God wants to use you as the one that reaches your friends and family and those that God places in the path of your life. Well, there's a way that we do this. I want you to follow along in a story with me. Go to the book of John. 
So just go back, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, just the book before Acts. Go to John chapter 4. We're going to read a lot. We're going to read a story, but I want to tell you what you're going to be looking for. There's three different stories in this one story. The first story is about Jesus and his disciples. Okay? Jesus and his disciples. The second story that you're going to see is a conversation between Jesus and a Samaritan woman. A woman from Samaria. A Samaritan woman that he meets, or really she meets him, and then the third story that you're going to see is about the Samaritan woman and the people of her town. The people of the area that she lives in called Samaria. Now, John chapter 4, beginning at verse number 1, follow along with me. It's going to be a long reading, but remember, we learn as disciples of Jesus Christ to read his word. Follow along with me. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing. Isn't that interesting? He was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about us going out and making disciples and baptizing. And that's what Jesus told us to do. So here we see Jesus is, is, is the example of that. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. Any disciples? Yeah, you can raise your hand and wave at me. You're a disciple of Jesus Christ. You're watching right now. That's the reason why. Verse number three. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Verse number four. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus tired. Wow. Really? Jesus got tired? Yeah. He did. So Jesus was tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon, about nap time for most of you. You know, that noon hour, you get a light little snack in the afternoon, lay down. Well, Jesus had been on a long journey. It was tiring. And so he sat down around noontime. But notice verse number seven. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Isn't that just like us disciples? We're always looking for food. You know, we're always more interested in the food than the work. But the disciples are in getting food. Jesus is resting. Now I want you to notice something. Jesus was not looking for this Samaritan woman. He was simply tired and sitting by the well. This Samaritan woman came to draw water. Watch what happens. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Do you notice the hostility of the woman? Isn't that how people are towards Christ when they're initially learning about him? And you, you know, people know you're going to be talking about Jesus in a minute. Oh, 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 you know, this is, I already have my own belief. I don't, no, no, just hang on. Just hang on. Let's follow along. Verse 13. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now here's the turning point. He says eternal life. Now he is talking about something personal to her. And notice what happens. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Now, I don't know about you, but I notice a lot of sarcasm there. She's being very sarcastic towards Jesus. She doesn't want to have a conversation with this Jewish man. She doesn't like the fact that he's sitting at the well, but he's already engaged in a conversation. And now he's mentioned this important term to her of eternal life. So now she responds to him sarcastically, and Jesus responds to her. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to come, come coming here to draw water. He told her, Go get your husband and come back. 
Wow, don't you know there was an awkward, silent pause for a few moments? Because that's what always happens when the truth is about to be revealed. And she says, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right when you said you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman says. Now, again, I think there's another moment of awkward silence. Wow, this man just read her news, just read her mail, just told her about her life. How did he know this? How did he know this about her? She'd never met him before, but all of a sudden this man is telling her things that nobody else knows, and she's certainly not going around talking about it. And notice what happens. Jesus said to her, you're right. The woman said to him in verse 19, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped, now, 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 now listen to this, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit and His worshipers must worship Him in the Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am. Am he. Now, I pause here for a moment because I want you to recognize that Jesus had to deal with religious arguments. Even Jesus had to deal with racism. Even Jesus had to feel, deal with different religious ideologies. Even Jesus had to deal with argumentative and attitudinal people. Even Jesus knew that the pathway to a person's salvation was telling them a story. Now this woman is there and the disciples start coming back. Now remember I told you there's three stories. So now the disciples are coming back. Verse 27. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. Ooh. Ooh. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. So he's teaching his disciples something here. He wants them to learn something. Follow along with what he is teaching them. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? Isn't that just like us? We're more concerned about the potluck than the power. You know, we always want to make sure that we're, we've got the food thing going on more than the worship thing. And, and, and Jesus said, well, don't worry about the food. I've got something I'm trying to, to teach you here. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. To finish his work. Everybody say that together. To finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life. So that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefit of their labor. Now we come back. He's talked with the disciples. He's dealt with them. Jesus had his conversation with the Samaritan woman. He's had his conversation with the disciples. Now here comes another conversation. What happens? Look at verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two 
days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, notice this, they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. You see, Jesus is setting an example for us of how that through our story, through our testimony, through our telling the truth to other people, it gives an introduction to Jesus Christ. And as we introduce Jesus Christ to them, it's not just the story that we tell, but it's what they learn from him. It's what he reveals to them. And so tonight I want us to look at this relationship and how Jesus shows us this example, specifically by talking about the Samaritan woman. Now, let's go back to verse number 10, verses 10 through 15. Verses 10 through 15. Look at this. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, the gift of God. So Jesus is giving her something. He wants to offer her something. I want you to understand that we are giving a gift of God to unbelievers. We are giving a gift of God to those who have not received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. It is a gift that he has given to us to share with them. The gift of God, who it is that asks you. Now he's saying... Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you. So it's about the who. We're introducing them. We're not, look, look what he did for me. No, we're introducing them to the who. Keep going. You would have asked him and he would have given you living waters. He would have given it to you if you ask. People don't receive because nobody is offering to them. Nobody wants to hear about Jesus Christ. Nobody wants to hear his story. Nobody wants to know anything about his power and what he can do until first they've heard your story. When they've heard your story, now they can believe that he can change lives. Because remember, you're witnessing to people that already know you. Look at verse number 14. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give, again, it's the gift of Jesus, it's the gift of God, the water that I give to them will become in them, it becomes in them, a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This woman now perceives that Jesus is not talking about the physical water. He's no longer talking about the physical water that they're going to draw from the well. He's talking about a gift from God. And she knows, because notice what she says. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water. Just give it to me. Just to, I, I want this water. Just give, If you have this water, give it to me. Isn't that just like so much of, uh, of people in the world today? Well, just give it to me. Well, no, no, no. There's something that has to take place before you can receive it. It just isn't a giveaway. He says, hey, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Well, why was she there? Well, she was there drawing water because she was ashamed of her lifestyle. And she was ashamed to be seen by the community. So she goes out earlier than anybody else to get water before anybody else can get to the well where she's going to be. She is getting out there at a time because she is not only trying to hide from the truth, but Jesus is revealing the truth. And we've got to understand that we have to tell the truth about our story if we expect other people to tell the truth about their story. Here we go. Jesus gives eternal life to everyone who will drink from him. Jesus gives eternal life to everyone who will drink from him. So I want you to understand that this water that he's put inside of you is intended to be a spring of water coming out of you. If it is coming out of you, where is it going? Well, he expects it to go to people who need eternal life. Let's go on to this next passage of scripture. What did Jesus tell her to do? What did Jesus tell her to do? Verses 16 through 18. He told her, he said, go call your husband and come back. Go call your husband and come back. Now, now, the Holy Spirit is at work here. The Holy Spirit is revealing things to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is at work in this woman's life. The Holy Spirit is the one that has drawn her to the well. The Holy Spirit is the one that is revealing into Jesus the truths about her life. And Jesus is speaking it to her. And so he asks this question because he already knows the truth. Notice what happens. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, 
you are right. When's the last time Jesus has said, you're right? Honestly. When's the last time that you've been praying? When's the last time that you've been worshiping? When's the last time that you've been in that place and you were so honest and so truthful and so forward with God that he stopped and he said, you know what? You're right. He said that to her. You're right. You're telling the truth now. Now, notice what happens. He says, you have not... Uh, the, the man you now have is not your husband. You've had five. What you have just said is quite true. Now, here's what I want us to understand. If we are ashamed of telling our story, other people will be ashamed of their story. If we tell the truth about Jesus and what he's done in our lives, people will believe that they can tell Jesus the truth about their lives. If people see that our lives have changed, they can believe that their life can be changed. So what we learn here is that Jesus knows everything about everyone. So Jesus already knows. Well, can I tell you this, that when you go to share your story with other people, because it's your friends and it's your family, they know your story too. They know your past. They know the type of person you were. They know your attitudes. They know your actions. They know your failures. They know your successes. They know everything. And so when you try and tell them your story, you've got to tell them the truth. And as you tell Jesus the truth and you tell others the truth, now they can be introduced to Jesus. Look at this next part, verses 28 and 29. Go down to verses 28 and 29. What was the woman's story? What was the woman's story? What was the story that she went back and she told the people in the town of Sychar? What is it that she went back and told them? Notice this, verse 28. Then leaving her pot, leaving her water jar, she left it. The woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man. Come see a man who told me everything. Now notice that she says, Could this be the Messiah? I'm not convinced at this point that she believes he's the Messiah. I'm not convinced at this point that she believes he's the Messiah. What I do know is this. She is so moved upon by what's taken place, and because he said, I am he, she is immediately wanting to go back and share with others to come and see this man. He told me everything. Notice, they came out of the town and made their way toward him. They made their way toward him. So what did the woman's story, what was her story? Come see a man who told me everything. Now, look at the next part of this. Go down to verse 39 and 42. What did the Samaritan say about her story? So she told her story. Let me slow down. She spends time with Jesus. Jesus reveals to her that he knows the truth. She notices there's something different about this man who already knows. She goes back to a town and she begins to tell them about this man who told her everything about her that the town already knew about her. The town is now interested, and this is what happens. Many of the Samaritans from that town, not everyone, not everyone, not everyone is going to listen, not everyone is going to receive, not everyone is going to be changed, not everyone is going to reply. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Now, now, her testimony becomes powerful because she is saying, come with me, see this man. They're spending time with him. Because remember, he spends two days. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Now what happened? Well, here's what happened. Remember, between verses 30 and 39, they asked Jesus to stay with them for two days. Well, if you ask me, that sounds like discipling. That sounds like discipling. Jesus stays with them for two days, and he teaches them, and he reveals to them. And as they're listening to him, they are saying, this man is the Messiah. We believe in this man. We believe the truth of who he is. During that same time, this woman becomes a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ. Her story as a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, because of her story, she went and told them. Jesus stayed with them. 
Now they're believing. We are introducing people to Jesus. Very important. When we talk about what Jesus said to them, they said, we no longer believe just because of what you said. It's not just your story. We have heard for ourselves. We know this man is the Savior of the world. This is the reason why we have to share the three circles. We want people to see God's story. Not just our story, but God's story. Now that we've seen that, we believe. Now what did Jesus say to his disciples? What did Jesus say to his disciples? Go back to verse 34. My food, Jesus said, is to do. My food is to do. Jesus said, this is what sustains me. This is what excites me. This is what keeps me going. What it is that feeds me is that I do the will of him who sent me. That's what excites me. That's what keeps me going. So Jesus is saying, the one who sent me and to finish his work. And that's our role. That's our responsibility. To finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months. He's saying, don't wait. Don't delay. You're always saying, I'll go tomorrow. I'll just pray for them. I'll pray somebody else goes. No, no, no. Jesus is saying to them, I tell you, open your eyes. Open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. What field? The field of souls. The field of people that God wants to draw to him. That he wants to bring to him. Well, how is he going to get them? He has to have someone who will go and tell the story. It's interesting that we always want to invite people to church, but nowhere in the scripture does he tell us to do that. Nowhere in the scripture does he say, go and convince people to go to church with you. What do I learn from this? Open your eyes. Look, the harvest around you is ready. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Turn to the person next to you and say, open your eyes. The harvest is ready around you. The harvest is ripe around you. Now, we look at the example of the Samaritan woman and Jesus talking with her. Her going back and telling her story, the people wanting to hear more about Jesus, to many people being followers. Jesus speaks to us as his disciples. Look at Matthew chapter 28 verses 18 through 20. In two parts, he gives us this command. He gives us this, what we call the Great Commission. Now, now please understand, he's talking to his disciples. Wave at me if disciple. All of you that are disciples. Come on, even of you that are watching. On, okay, you are a disciple. So he's talking to you. He's not talking to missionaries. He's not talking to evangelists. He's not talking to apostles. He's not talking to other leaderships. He's talking to you. You are the disciple of Jesus Christ, every single one of us. And so Jesus is talking to you. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus has already died. He's been resurrected. He's received this authority. He is now saying, I'm going to share this authority with you. I'm giving it to you. Here's what I want you to do with it. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And teaching them. There's not a period at the end of that word Holy Spirit. There's a comma. It's a continued statement. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, let's look at this closely. Therefore, go, make disciples, all nations, baptizing them, teaching them. I am with you. I'm going with you. I'm going to be there. As you go in my name, I'm going to be there. The Holy Spirit is going to be there. I'm going to stay with you until the end of the age. Well, I don't know what the end of the age is, but I'm going to assume that's either when Christ comes or when I die for me. That's the end of my age. Don't want it to happen anytime soon, other than I'd love for Christ to come back quickly 
That I would really enjoy. So he gives them this command. It's not a recommendation. It's a command. When my daughter was very little, uh, Lucy, when she was just a, a small child, I, I would say to her, I'd say, you know, Goose, you need to go clean your room. And, and she thought that was a really great idea. She thought that was, you know, wow, that's, that's sure, that's a great idea. She didn't know that that was a command. She thought that, you know, maybe, well, I'll consider that. And I'd say, no, Lucy, you need to go clean your room. And so she would go and she would clean her room. And, and I'd say, okay, well, I'm going to come check and see if you cleaned your room or not. And I'd go up and I would look in her room and sure, there would be stuff out of the floor. But then if I look under the bed, guess what I would find? Everything is shoved under the bed. And if I open the closet, guess what I'd find? Well, everything is... So, so, so she didn't really clean her room because she didn't put things back where they were supposed to go. She didn't do what she was supposed to. Now, I want you to understand that, that when we say, go make disciples, he's not just saying, pray about it. He's not just saying, talk about it. He's not saying, oh, well, we need another class at the church. No, you don't need another class. No, you don't need to just pray about it. No, you don't need to come up with another program. You need to have the passion for lost people that says, I want to go finish and do what Jesus told me to do. If we look at the second part, we've got to take the second part by looking at the first part. Go reach everyone in your world. Make disciples, not just church members. Now, I don't mean to, you know, I'm not, not trying to offend anybody here, but, but we're not going to be measured when we get to heaven by the size of our churches. And disciples, lost people, are brought into the kingdom of God more on a one-to-one -one relationship with people going out and reaching their friends and family than waiting for everyone to come to an altar at a church. So he says, make disciples, not just church members, reach every ethnic group. Go to everybody, every tribe, every tongue, every, uh, all of your neighbors, all of your friends, your family, all of those that are around you. You go to all nations, go to all of them. And then he says very clearly, baptize them. Well, there's that word again, baptize. Why? Because baptism is the outward expression of the inward change that's taken place in their life. And then you're going to teach them to obey. How are you going to teach them to obey? You're going to teach them these five lessons. You're going to teach them these five lessons. And at the end of these five lessons, they should be doing the same thing that you're doing. But here's the reason why many people don't. Part 2. Part 2. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus told his disciples to go make disciples, but you notice they didn't do it? From that day on that mountainside in, in Galilee where he met with them and he gave them this commission, he gave them this command, they didn't get up and go do it. Why didn't they do it? Well, there was something missing. Now, Jesus visits with them again in the book of Acts before the day of Pentecost, and he tells them these words. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, remember, he told them, go to Jerusalem and wait until you receive this power. See, this is why we need the power of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because without the Holy Spirit, no one gets drawn to God. Without the Holy Spirit, we don't know how to pray. So the Holy Spirit helps us to learn the Word of God. The Holy Spirit helps us to pray. The Holy Spirit is the one that gives us the boldness to go on. You will be my witnesses. You might be. You could be. You may be. No. He's saying, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea. And, there's that word again, Samaria. You're going to go back to the very place you didn't want to go. Disciples didn't want to go through Samaria. Disciples didn't want to go that way. They don't like the Samaritans. Samaritans are a lot like the Jews. Jesus was not afraid to go where other people did not want to go. Doesn't that sound like the day that we live in right now? Someone's got to be willing to go to those that need to hear about Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, look, wherever you're going, I'm going to go with you even to the end of the age. Even to the end of the age. Now, how do we do this? How do we do this? Well, we begin with an evangelistic prayer list. My evangelistic prayer list. I want you to take about five minutes of time. I want you to take about five minutes of time right now. I want you to take about five minutes of time. And with your piece of paper there, some of you have a list. 
Some of you have the handout. Some of you just grab a piece of paper and a pen. They're at home. And I want you to begin to write down the names of everyone that you know that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Now, we're not, we're not talking about judging people. We're not criticizing people. We're not condemning people. If you don't know for sure that that person in your sphere of influence, if you don't know for sure that that person knows Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, you need to find out. You need to find out. That's a part of the ripe harvest field that God is pointing out to you. Jesus is saying, open your eyes. You have a story. You know my story. You have the power. You are my witness. There are people around you that I need to send you to. But who are they? Well, I want you to begin by making a personal and a mental note, physically writing down the names of those people that you know do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Begin with your friends and your family. Begin with your immediate family. Move to your extended family. You say, well, I'm already praying for them. No, 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 I want you to write it down. I want you to write it down. Friends, co-workers, fellow students, people that you meet, you know, you, you spend time with in hobbies and, uh, and other uh, time. Maybe even enemies. People that used to be your friend. People that used to be near to you. People that maybe even used to go to church with you. People that used to worship with you, but you haven't seen them. You don't know where they are. You, maybe you even know where they are and that they're not serving God. And You need to write their name down because somebody needs to begin praying for them. And you need to begin with this evangelistic prayer list. Now, now as you begin with this evangelistic prayer list... You're just writing down names. You're going to find out. You're going to find out. You're going to spend time in prayer for these names. I want to just take a few minutes right now and just begin writing down those names. Family. Friends. Maybe some of your next door neighbors. People across the street. Friends that you grew up with in high school. Family members that you know are far from God. This isn't difficult. You know their names. They're important. They're souls. They're people. And when we pray, we should call their names. It's a wonderful thing to know that when we become a follower of Jesus Christ, when we redeem that our name is written down in a book. It's preserved. Well, we need to write down the names of those that God is bringing to our minds right now. Your family, extended family, friends, co-workers, schools or clubs, your neighbors, people that, from the grocery store, the person that does your hair, your barber, the person that, that makes takes care of your lawn, um, your favorite restaurant, the person that waits on you, your enemies. Those whom you have hurt or hurt you. Any others the Holy Spirit is bringing to your mind. People that he's already at work in their life and he is, he, he is needing to send someone to them and he wants to use you. It's so convenient for us to pray for God to send someone else when the truth is he wants to send you. Isn't it interesting that this Samaritan woman immediately went back into her own town and confessed her own story to convince the people, listen to me, to convince the people to come see this man. She had to confess who she was and what she had done to convince the people who already knew as well so that they would come and see this man. Something was so compelling about her story that this woman who had had five husbands and the man she was with wasn't her husband now and, and, and was out getting water by herself because she didn't want to be seen by the community. Something about her lifestyle, something about her life simply wasn't altogether right and altogether good and, and, and no doubt she was ashamed and, and didn't want people to see her or to associate with people. But, 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 but even the community had an opinion about her. 
They, they had an opinion about her, her trustworthiness and her lifestyle. and uh, they, they had an opinion about her as a woman. And, 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 and we even see that in the conversation she has with Jesus. I, I'm, a, I'm a Samaritan. I'm a woman. I have nothing to do with you. Even his disciples were, were, were a little bit caught off guard about why was he talking with this woman. So, so all of these elements are going into her story that is so compelling that when she goes back into the town, her family, her friends, her neighbors, maybe her former husbands, maybe the man that she was with that wasn't her husband, she's saying, all of them, you need to come and see this man. You need to have that passion that says, to all of you, even those that I've wronged you, even those of you that know that I've, I, I, I've done wrong things and hurtful things, and I want to tell you about this man who changed my life. You've got to come and see this man. So make that list. And then as you're making that list, you're going to add to it every day, weeks, as you're introduced to new people, you take on a new job. This is a living document. This is everyone that you know. And all you're doing, you, you, you can't save anybody. But all you're doing is you're saying that, God, if you place these people in the path of my life, if you put them in the sphere of my influence, then I want to make sure that they're going to heaven. Because I sure don't want them to go to hell. And if you really don't want people to go to hell, if you really don't want people to go to hell, then you will make the personal sacrifice to share your story, give them the opportunity, offer them the gift of living water. Up to that point, then it's up to them and the Holy Spirit. You can't make anyone be saved, but you can certainly give them the opportunity. You can bring them to that water. All right, so you've had a few minutes to write. Even after we finish this class, keep writing. Go back and work on your list. Write down the names of your friends and your families and, and, and begin praying for them. And here's what you're going to pray for. You're going to pray for five specific things. First of all, you're going to pray God to prepare you to be bold in making the invitation. You're going to pray that God will make you bold and be willing to make an invitation. Now, what does that invitation look like? Well, the invitation can be very simple. Hey, I'd like to have you come over for dinner. Would you meet me for coffee at Starbucks? Hey, we haven't seen each other in a long time. Would you like to have lunch? You want to find a place where that person is comfortable and where you're comfortable in being able to share with them your story because you know where this is going to go. They don't. But you need to have the boldness and pray that God gives you the boldness to make the invitation. Second, for God to prepare your friend to accept your invitation. For your friend to accept your invitation. Whatever has transpired between the two of you, whatever uh, argument they can give. And remember, the Samaritan woman and Jesus, they're, they're having this dialogue and they, they have a couple of different arguments. They have arguments about race. They have arguments about religion. They have arguments about relationship. They have arguments about who owns the water. They, there's, a lot, there's a lot of politics and religion and per, personal things that are going on here. And, and that's going to happen. But if you pray, if you pray, if you pray, then the Holy Spirit will go before you, work in that person's life, and to prepare their heart to receive the invitation. The, the Holy Spirit already knows what's going on, especially if you know that that person is in crisis. If you know that they just, just lost their job, or they received a, a bad medical report, or they have a broken relationship, or, or a financial challenge, whatever it is, whatever's bringing a crisis in their life, that's the best time to bring them living water. So you want to pray that they will receive your invitation. Number three, pray God to provide the right time and place for the invitation. The right time and place. Now, I strongly recommend invite them to your home. Invite them to your home where you can make tea, you can make coffee, you can have lunch, you can do it, but you have a casual environment, they're comfortable, you can hang out, you don't have to worry about time, you don't have to worry about other people listening around you. If you want to go to their home, if, if you, but, but find a place. Make sure... But it's the right time and the right place for the invitation. Number four. For God to prepare their heart to receive his invitation. For God to prepare their heart to receive the invitation. Do you see all the invitations here? 
A lot of invitations going on here. And that's all you're doing. You're just inviting them. You want to give them a gift. You're just inviting them to receive this gift. And so you're, you're inviting, the, asking God to prepare their heart to receive His invitation. Receive His invitation. So, so Father, when I invite my friend and they accept my invitation and, and they, 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 they come to my house and we're talking and I share with them my story and I share with them the three circles and I ask them, is your world broken? Then, Holy Spirit, I need for you to do the work in them to finish this. I need you to help me in completing that. And then the final thing is for God to continue using you to bring others to Christ. And the reason why I say that is because not everyone will. Not everyone will listen. Not everyone will receive. But don't you think everyone should have the opportunity to hear? Don't you think everyone should have the opportunity here? And that's all we're giving. We're giving the opportunity. We're giving the invitation. And so if they, if they reject it, what do you do? You leave their name on your prayer list and you continue praying for them. You continue praying for them. And eventually, circumstances are going to arise that one of two things is going to happen. Either that person is going to come to you and say, Hey... I need, I need you. I need you to pray for me. I, I, I remember the conversation we had? Or you're going to find another opportunity to meet with them again. And when you meet with them again, guess what you're going to do? You're going to share your story. You're going to share the three circles. And you're going to ask them, is your world broken? Bring them to Jesus Christ. So that's the method. That's what Jesus gave us an example to do. It's how he did it. It's how he wants us to do it. He gave other specific instructions to his disciples, I believe in Luke chapter 10. But we're not talking about going to strange places. We're not talking about finding the house of peace and trying to... That's the work of an evangelist that's working in a missionary, working among a people group or working in an area that they don't know the people. And he tells them, be sure that you go as two. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people you know and they know you, and they know what your life was like and what your life is like. And because of the difference that Jesus Christ has made in your life, they will hear your story and believe. But because of Christ's story, even more will believe. So that's how this all connects together. Jesus gave us a command. Go make disciples. Well, when you go and make disciples, that's not about inviting people to come to church. It's not about inviting people to come to a club. That's about you going out and witnessing to other people, making that invitation to them. But then what happens when they receive? Well, you've got to disciple them. When they say, yes, my world is broken, and you lead them to receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, then you have a responsibility. Listen to me. You have a responsibility to disciple them. And, and my prayer for you is this. My prayer for you is that you will open up your home, that you will open up your time one night a week, one day a week. About 90 minutes is about how long it should take. About a third of the time you're going to spend in just encouraging the person, doing some prayer, singing a song. You're going to spend 30 minutes teaching them the lesson, talking about the scriptures, letting them write down their answers, sharing with them. And then you're going to spend about 30 minutes practicing the things that I've taught you. How to write your story, how to learn the three circles, creating an evangelistic prayer list, practicing these things together, helping them to pray for the lost. Now the wonderful thing about this is that these five lessons are designed. These five lessons are designed that a person can join you at any time. So if you're discipling a, a new believer and it's the third week and you're into the third lesson, you don't have to go back to lesson one because you have another new believer. You can begin with lesson number three and keep going. These five lessons interact with one another. So you can take that one night and say, this is when I disciple new believers. I'm inviting you to come to my home. I'm inviting you to come and learn about your relationship with Jesus Christ. And the goal and the hope is that they too will do what you're doing. And they will if you're setting the example. Now, if you bring other people to Jesus Christ, and I pray that you do, however you do, bring them to Jesus Christ. If you're going to bring them all to church, 
and you're going to disciple them through your church, then you need to make sure that you have someone in your church that is going to take these people aside from the regular congregation and disciple them for those five weeks. New believers can join at any time. You can begin with the passion for evangelism and then go back to I have a servant's heart. You can begin at uh, I have a growing heart and you can, they can join at any time in any one of these lessons. I want you to understand that. So when you say, I'm going to pray for my lost friends and loved ones. I'm going to ask God to open the door of opportunity. I'm going to share with them my story. I'm going to share with them the three circles. And because I've been praying, I'm expecting I'm expecting them to come to Christ. If they come to Jesus Christ, open your door to teach them. Any one of you can teach these five lessons. You do not have to teach them in the depth and in the way that I have because I'm teaching you how to teach the lessons. Do you understand that? I'm teaching you how to, the key points but you want them to read the scripture. You want them to write down their answers. You want to have a conversation with them about why they feel the way they do. What they're seeing in the scriptures. And for them to make the commitments. I would that we were all in one room together tonight. And being together in this one room. I, I would love to have been able to see how many of you are planning to be baptized. And then I would say, okay, I want to spend time with those of you that want to be baptized. And make sure that you know your story. Because before you're baptized... You need to share your story. And I want to know who you're going to invite. Because this is a party. This is a celebration. This is an exciting thing. This is not about a bad person becoming good. This is about a dead person coming alive. And that's powerful. And you can share your story and bring your friends and your families that are witnessing your baptism to Jesus Christ right then, right there. It's not difficult. It's not impossible. It's not impossible. It's not impossible. But what I've learned is for most people, it is improbable. Most people probably will not do this. Let's put it all together and I'll wrap it up. Here's how it works. My evangelistic prayer list. Pray before you go. Pray before you go. Make sure that you're praying. Praying for people far from God. Seeking an opportunity to introduce them to Jesus. So the first thing that you've got to do is have your evangelistic prayer list. Be praying for them. Now remember, week number one, when we talked about I have a surrendered heart, and we talked about how that Jesus came into your life, and I ask you, who are five people that you want to share that news with this week? That's, that's the beginning place. Who are five people? Then it's lesson number two. Who are five people you want, to, you want to bring to your water baptism? Five people that you wanted to bring. So now we're talking about my evangelistic prayer list, making the invitation. Number two, tell your story. Be sure and tell your story. Don't tell someone else's story. Tell your story. Share your story in less than three minutes. Your life before Christ, how you came to Christ, your life with Christ. Number three, the three circles. Be sure that you have this down. Grab a napkin. Grab something. Take a piece of paper, an envelope, whatever you have close by. Pen, pencil, chalk, crayola, whatever you have to write with, show them. Begin, begin with, let me show you how my world was broken. Let me show you how my world was broken. And then you go into the three circles. My broken world, God's perfect design, God sending his son into the world, how that sin and selfishness separated you from God's perfect plan. Remember this? Repented of those sins that separated you from God. You believe that Jesus died, that he rose from the dead. Now you choose to obey and follow him back to God's perfect plan. That's the three circles. When you finish, when you finish sharing the three circles, you immediately ask the question, is your world broken? You don't with man, isn't that cool? Check that out. That was so cool when I learned. No, no, no. You immediately end. You've just introduced them to Jesus. You have just introduced them to God's work. You have just introduced them. You've prayed for them. The Holy Spirit is at work in them. They've heard your story. They've now, now they're listening closely. You've shared the three circles. The Holy Spirit is now speaking into them. They're seeing in the example. They're hearing in your story. 
You know what? Your life sounds like my life used to be. Your broken world is my life right now. That's exactly where I am. Is your world broken? You immediately finish with that. And then at the ending, disciple the new believers personally. Now, if a person says, no, my world's not broken, I'm good, it's all fine, nothing wrong here, okay, leave them alone. Stop talking. You're not going to convince them. You're not going to argue with them. There's nothing more that you're going to be able to do to try and get them to pray with you or to receive Christ as their Savior. What are you going to do? You're going to keep them on your evangelistic prayer list. You're going to continue praying for them. You're going to look for the opportunity to meet with them again. Find them in a place of crisis. Find them that, that opportunity. Continue praying for them. If they receive Jesus as their personal Savior, right then, right there, say, I want to meet with you this week. I want to meet with you this week to begin showing you God's love through His Word. And I'm going to teach you the five characteristics of the heart. I'm going to teach you the five characteristics of the heart. I'm going to teach you the five characteristics of the heart. You don't need to tell them I'm going to teach you how to be a disciple. They're going to get that when you start teaching the lessons. You're going to tell them, I want to teach you five characteristics of the heart. When they finish those five lessons, they too will be able to do this very same thing. Evangelistic prayer list is where it all begins. If you don't pray, nothing happens. If you don't pray, nothing happens. But if you pray, if you pray, prepare to do the work. If you pray, prepare to do the work. Now let's wrap this up and we'll be done. I have an evangelistic heart. Here's our statement for the closing of this lesson. I want to thank you for these five weeks that we've spent together. Been some powerful lessons, some powerful learning, and I hope that tonight there was a lot in that Bible reading. There was a lot in that passage of Scripture. The relationship of Jesus and his disciples, the relationship with Jesus and the Samaritan woman, the relationship of the Samaritan woman among the people in her town. What do we see in that? Well, we see our relationship with Jesus Christ. We see our relationship as a disciple. We see our relationship to reach our town and those around us. Here's what we say. I have an evangelistic heart. When we say I have an evangelistic heart, we're pointing that out to people. And we're saying, I recognize God's purpose in my life is to share the love of Jesus Christ with everyone. To share the love of Jesus Christ with everyone. My new life as a disciple of Jesus Christ is to have a heart that is surrendered, growing, serving, giving, and evangelizing the world God loves. I am a disciple making disciples by bringing others to Jesus Christ and teaching them these lessons. That's the statement of a person who evangelizes the lost. Now, thank you for the five weeks that we've spent together. I would like to somehow keep in touch with you. You can find me on Facebook. If you want to contact me by other means, Pastor Greg knows how to get a hold of me. I would like to be able to spend time with those of you that say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to begin praying for the lost. I'm going to begin. And if you would like for me to help mentor you through this process, I would be glad to do that. I would love to see a revival of discipleship making break out in the Phoenix metropolitan area. It can begin, but it begins with you. It begins with me. It begins with us doing what Jesus commanded us to do. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And here's his promise. Here's his promise. You're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. You're going to have people who are going to come to Jesus Christ. You're going to have some that are just going to immediately reject you. Some people are going to even laugh at you. Some people are going to say, I don't ever want to hear from you again. You've wasted my time. People are going to be unkind towards you. But here's the thing. Jesus said, no matter what anybody else does, I'm with you, even to the end of the age. Don't give up. Don't give up. You are my witness. Blessings to you. I look forward to being with you again soon. Thank you, Pastor Greg.